Hello family, welcome back to another video on Amis Haven. My name is Gifty. If this is your first time seeing me, I do videos on grad school, grad school experience, I do natural hair videos. Stick around, join the family, hit the subscribe button. So today, as you may have seen by the title of the video, I am talking to my friends here at University of Montana and I would like them to share a little experience that they've acquired throughout their yeah, semester staying here in this university. So without further ado, let's get right into today's video. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this with me and sharing your experience on Amos Haven. I really appreciate it. So, getting right into the video, I want to start by asking Tilly, how was your process like in terms of applying into your program? And if you mind telling us what your program is. Okay, I'm studying a Master of Arts in Economics, and the process was basically the same as every other process. I think the only difference is that you don't apply separately for scholarship. So when you apply, you are automatically considered for scholarship. So the only difference is that your decision comes very late. So my decision came in May, and yeah, most decisions come in February. So it was like a last minute option for me because I had other schools that I was planning on doing, and this came in May, and their offer was good. So Ahead with well, now with you mentioning this, I want you to tell us a little bit like how did it feel like when this, like your decision came in May? Like, I know this is like very new. Yes. How were you feeling like, or did you have like other options that you were going to go to? So, I had like two other options that I was working towards, but they were not in the US, they were in Canada. So, this was in the US, and um, I was excited, but then again, I had to start the whole U.S. visa process, and which was so it was between doing the U.S. visa law process and just doing the Canadian one where you just submit your documents and we are done. Yeah, so it was a decision between the two. But what made me choose here was the money. I mean, their offer was very good, <laughs> so I had to come here. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> it's the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so um, Tilly, do you mind? Sorry, not Tilly, Wendy. Wendy, do you mind sharing us the program that you're doing here at the University of Montana? Sure. So I'm doing a Master of Arts in Communication Studies. Yes, it will be my first year. Great. So, Master of Arts in Communication, how is the process like? Are you a GTA? Are you a GRE? Okay, so just like Tilly said, um, you are considered only for the program alongside a GTA position. They do not take you without actually awarding you that position because they need um, students to teach their freshmen and their sophomores public speaking. So you are awarded a graduate teaching assistantship when you are considered for a position. Right. So if I hear you correctly, you are teaching public speaking. Yes, I teach public speaking. Right, so my first question is, how are you teaching public speaking? <laughs> <laughs> if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Okay, so with no prior like background in communication studies, because I did my undergrad in a whole different field, I it was nerve wracking from the beginning. But they are very supportive faculty and they understood that I had no prior experience. So we underwent some training the first week I got here to try to help me especially cope with the new change. It was like a, a very drastic change. Yes. But public speaking, <laughs> I think public speaking is a very interesting course. It's basically how to help students gain confidence when they're speaking, how to conduct themselves, how to make sure that the audience they're speaking to are very important factor in a lot of things when you're moving your guests, like your hand gestures, or 
posture, they are all very important. It's a very interesting class to teach. I, I always have fun when we teach it. Speaking. Right. So we will come. We will come to the the details of like how you co coordinate your classroom and all of that. Before we do that, Tilly, can you share with us how your GTA process is like? So I was I was a GTA back in Ghana before I came here, and in Ghana I used to teach like of course, but for here um, they mostly let the GTA relax. So instead of Wendy's program where Wendy has to teach. I just sit in the office, so I don't have to go to the class to teach. Students will have to come to me if they need any help. So I have office hours. So after the main professor has put in class and you need further explanation, then you would come during my office hours. Then I explain to you what I like to you want to understand after the class. So it's a bit, it's a big difference from the GTA that I know back home and then here. So here, here for me, it's more relaxing because I just sit in the office and. If no student come, I'm busy. <laughs> wow, that's yeah, that's very interesting. Like, it does happen as such, like in different universities. Like, de depending on the demand, you might have to teach, or you might have to do office hours, or you might have to work with some other person, or even like do like a one-on-one -on -one tutorials and all of that. So yeah, that's that's amazing. So let's let's finally talk about how do you coordinate your classroom for public speaking? Because for me. The, the mention of public speaking is like people being creative, people being more like cognizant about the environment. Like, hey, like, you know, these are around me. I need to make sure that these people or these audiences are like listening to me and all of that. So, how do you teach these, you know, these kids to like involve everything that they're doing, their thoughts, their visuals, and everything? Okay, so I think. The one important thing I realized is that American students are very confident in the first place. Yes. So with that basis, like building them up for other public speaking events, I wouldn't say it's easy, but they make the process adaptable. So it's just basically trying to hone in their skills so that maybe later on in life when they reach on professional levels, they can inculcate whatever they learned in the classroom in those places. Usually, most of them told me in high school they already took some public speaking classes or were enrolled in some public speaking courses. So it's just like making the classroom a very one conducive place, a very entertaining place for them because it's public speaking. They don't want to come and sit there and then you give them a whole like lecture and then you leave. <laughs> activities are very important as part of the class. They actually tell us to let them do a lot of more activities that teach them. So we do several activities for the day, maybe twice. I try to do it twice a day for pre-classroom. So we either do impromptu speeches or recently I inculcated something called continue the story. So I start off with like a story of my own, a random one I made up in my head. Then I just randomly point to any one of them, then they continue, then they also randomly point to their classmates just to form that community and help them like know each other also. So it's a very exciting. Interesting experience. Yeah, I, I think public speaking is a very interesting <laughs> program to do and as such teacher. So like for me, like you saying that you teach about public speaking, I think in my head that you're a really good communicator. Like you, you, <laughs> yeah, because you you have to be very good to be able to like even think of pointing into people's like skills and all of that. Yeah, so oh, yeah, sure. it's it, it's <laughs> It's amazing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, so now that we've dealt with GTA and like duties on campus for the money, let's talk about your personal studies. I know graduate school, people think that it can be easy. Other people, you know, it's debatable. What do you think doing a master's in economics? Well, I think the main difference or the main shock you would get is the differences in the teaching between Ghana and this place. So this is my second master's in economics. I already have my first master's in Ghana. And it's like a whole two different, I mean, it's the same thing, but the way these people handle the course is like very different. So you think, oh, of course, before coming, I was like, I already have a master's. This would be like an easy route for me. I, I know everything, but I came in the first semester, I'm like, 
what the hell? <laughs> I'm new, like this feels like a new program altogether. But yeah, they they teach very very differently, and the way they don't even explain some concepts, and it's it's different, but it's more practical. So you are learning and you are applying it. Not like the program in Ghana where. I was just learning the theory, so you just learn it, you write your exams, you are done. But this place, you'd learn it, they would give you a paper to read, you based on what you've learned, and then you would have to like come to the class, tell them what you've learned, and how that paper relates to what they taught you there. So it's more practical, and I, it's, it's challenging, honestly. And I wouldn't advise anyone to feel like, oh, I'm a shark, or oh, I know, so it would be easy for me. Trust me, it's, it's, it's not easy. It wouldn't be easy. You, you would struggle, especially your first semester. <laughs> Yeah. struggle and I tell in the first year or first person like a new person coming there that during your first semester you would at least cry one or two times in class you, you will because you'd feel like what am I doing here <laughs> how did I really get into this program I'm so down <laughs> you'd have that you'd have that feeling like multiple times in class but it's it's fine you'll get through it it's, it's fine yeah. I think the the bigger picture is the willingness to want to stay and be part because you realize that the gap is too huge and you know these people are like easily grasping what it wants to be said in class and you're like what is going on here but like being like having that will to yeah. stay and still like keep going that is like the bigger that's the magic i guess you sometimes use the will like yeah, multiple times you feel like going home <laughs> yeah. if you get a ticket i'm sure you go <laughs> But if you turn back and you look back home, you go home. <laughs> well, we'll leave that here. <laughs> so, Wendy, for you, you you transition from a different program to a different program. How how has it been for you? Okay, so <laughs> it also wasn't like an easy transition because it's it's like a whole new different thing that I came here to study. So, whole new concepts, whole new. Theories, some I've maybe never heard before in my life, <laughs> but <laughs> I think that it's like what you said the world part continue because you came from a very far place and you do not come here to fail. So, the best advice I can give is like use your classmates, like those who already have the experience, those who have already had like prior knowledge of the course that maybe you transition to try to. Gain help from them, you cry definitely. I think. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think if you are very determined and you use the resources that are available to you, you can do it. Great, right? So that's amazing. Now let's let's get into something that I rarely talk about finances. Like when people see, oh, like you you get admission to University of Montana with a scholarship of twenty six thousand blah blah. blah. <laughs> Per ten months, like people think it's like very big. Like, what goes into the finances aspect of being a graduate student? Honestly, when you get your scholarship letter, whatever amount you see there, don't be excited because it's very like in Ghana. I'm sure when you see that amount and it's in dollars, you convert. You're like, I'm a rich woman. <laughs> if you come here, you are you are extremely poor. <laughs> and you struggle. <laughs> Yeah, but below I mean, the standard. way below the standard because you would have to most of the scholarship doesn't cover accommodation utilities transportation fortunately for us our state has free transport so we don't have to pay transportation but other schools you would have to get up for transportations and other things and the scholarship money it wouldn't be enough it would you would try to survive and you try to use it wisely but the expenses that keeps coming and the bills that keeps coming would not make it enough for you to even try to like use it and i think one thing that most people don't talk about in terms of the finances and mostly i think it's not just our experience we ask other students in other universities and they also have the same experience so in ghana when you're paying um, school fees or tuition it all comes as one so, but here they have something called tuition and something called fees. So the scholarship covers tuition, not fees. So fees, you would pay your fees. And you would pay that fees from the scholarship money you've seen in your letter. So imagine paying your fees, paying your rent, utility, transportation, internet. Yeah, it's, it's a whole thing. But 
when you come after some time, maybe the first two months, three months will be challenging, but after some time, you would adjust and try and um, manage or look for ways to manage and survive with the small money you have. But the money is small. Yeah, the money is small. I <laughs> think it's <laughs> and you have to send remittances back home and all of that. I mean, if you have to. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they see you outside. They're already asking. <laughs> yes. Right. So so let's let's get it.